Hello, everybody. We are back for Caravan of Garbage, the show where we go, all right, we'll, we'll do some MCU stuff, all right? That's right, yeah. It's been a, a long time coming. Bit of a somber start there, I thought. You were like, oh. I didn't want it to be, Mason. I, let, let's have an upbeat good time, you know? Here we go. That's what Caravan of Garbage is. Or people read the title and go, this is actually my favourite movie and you didn't get it. Maybe you didn't watch the video. Maybe you didn't get it. Maybe you didn't get the movie when you watched it. Wow. Maybe you've watched this movie 100 times <laughs> and you don't understand a single word of it. Me? Yeah, you. Oh, no. I've made so many notes. <laughs> it's just, James, that's just gibberish. I can see it right in front of you. <laughs> so we are, over the next three episodes, every Tuesday, going to be talking about the Iron Man Thrilogy, Mason. That's right. Leave a like if you could. The shoot to Thrilogy. Absolutely. Remember they, remember they were trying to be like, oh, his, his theme song is always ACDC songs. Yeah, yeah. They never got to rock and roll train. <laughs> Nobody did. Oh, nobody got, nobody to, rock got roll to, to rock and roll train. So if you remember uh, in the months and years leading up to this movie, mm-hmm. it was a big deal for Marvel because they weren't doing well. They'd sold off a lot of their properties. And the headline was when they announced solo films for like Captain America, Ant-Man, Thor, Iron Man. It was Marvel rolls out their B team. You yeah, know? Some, some, some real dregs. And, and it was like, you know, they're casting with unknowns and has-beens. Mm, ha! And a lot of people, like, I wonder, I wonder in retrospect, I think this movie's aged really well. Agreed. I've, I've seen some criticism of it, you know, in the recent past where people have said, oh, it's, you know, it's, oh, it's, you know, it's not that special, is it? But at the time... Yeah, it's it's very unusual. I mean, th- this was a turning point for Marvel. In 2008, they, they'd produced some disasters. They had burned a lot of their existing properties. Yep. Like you said, they, all their hottest properties at the time, the X-Men, Spider-Man, Fantastic Four... Ghost Rider, Ghost Rider, Blade, like they, they had, they had licensed them out for very cheap rates. Yep, forever essentially. They're, yeah, they're, they still haven't got a number of them back. Yeah, and again, this is their the the characters they had left to work with were kind of their C list mm. and and D list characters. And my favorite character as a kid was Iron Man, and so I faced a lot of questions like, is he a robot? What's his deal? What's going on there? Explain this to me. Yeah. Explain it to me. And I was like, I won't. You're going to have to wait for the movie with Tom Cruise <laughs> in the 90s. Well, that's the thing, because the rights to this eventually lapsed and went back to Marvel, but it bounced around multiple studios, Universal, Fox, New Line. Tom Cruise was on board at one point. Nick Cage was on board at one point. I've got a question for you, though. If they made this movie now, and Robert Downey Jr. was the age now that he was then, okay. and had had his past, you know, with mm-hmm. drug abuse and all that, even though he, he'd come clean at this point, do you think Disney would hire him? Because they oh, have a history of, question. of like not hiring people. Because like of course, him. this movie was made when Marvel were working with Paramount. Yeah, Disney hadn't acquired Marvel at this point, and it was an independent production. It was yeah. Marvel. Owned My answer is, I cannot know. <laughs> That's a good answer. For I don't know the mysteries of Disney employing some sort of time-travelling Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> who doesn't age and is still that age now. Yeah. I just don't know. <laughs> but I thought the question you were going to ask was, yeah. what do you think this movie would have looked like if it had been made in the 90s? And the answer was absolute crap. Robot jocks. Look, it would look like robot. It would look like if anybody has seen the um, robot jocks, robo jocks, robot jocks, obviously, okay. and then robot wars, the sequel. <laughs> uh, but it would look like if anybody has seen the uh, the old Captain America telly movies yeah. from back in the day, where he uh, he. <laughs> He feigns being sick so he can hijack a car twice. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, and he's got a he wears a big sort of motorcycle crash helmet. Yes, that's what this character would look like. Hundred percent. It just look just like enormously head heavy and ungainly. Yeah. Best case scenario, it looks like steel. Oh yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, yeah. In many ways, that's also a worst case scenario. Agreed. We've done a video on it. I think there it is. So these are other names that uh, apparently they went to, though not all of these are confirmed. Hugh Jackman. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Clive Owen. I don't hate that. No, I don't hate it either, yeah. sure. Timothy Olfant, he's mentioned in a Conan interview that he screen tested the same day as Robert Downey Jr. Okay, pretty good. Like I, Timothy Olfant. I mean, Robert Downey Jr. is perfect, but yes. that's a great choice. Yeah, Timothy agreed, Olfant, yeah. 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 Sometimes you, we hear these lists of casting options and we're like, what, what, why? How dare you? Must have a great agent. You know, that sort of <laughs> yeah, that's stuff. Right, but yeah. These are all good. The thing is as well... 
It's great casting. It's perfect timing for Marvel, for Robert Downey Jr. They had the freedom to cast him because it was outside of a regular studio system. Mm -hmm. He was an absolute roll of the dice, if you don't mind the pun, Mason. Yeah. And he will be the footage of when he rolls the dice, Ben will put it in. As I understand it, he doesn't even he isn't the cast member who was paid the most for this movie. No, that was Terrence Howard. Famously, the first man to be hired for the Marvel Universe. Yeah. And also the uh, first man not to be rehired for the next sequel. First in, first out, mate. Right. We'll talk it's a real FIFO <laughs> work at this guy. <laughs> we'll talk about that more next week on, on the recast. But going back to this, and look, I didn't really need to because I've seen it multiple times. It does feel kind of quaint because a lot of this has been replicated since. The template was set and then we see it in an Ant-Man or a Captain Marvel. Like we see it in these origin movies. It is you know? a fairly standard uh, system. Uh, you, yeah. you get yourself a flawed hero and then they get him to a spot of hot water and then they gain the powers, and then they learn a valuable lesson about and, life. And then somebody shows up who has their powers. And then a blue <laughs> sky beam shoots into the air, yep. and that's the end of the movie. That's every movie we've ever seen. Every movie, I'll, I'll not, I'll, I'll, sh I shan't see another movie that yeah. isn't like that. But this was kind of, you know, the first one, uh, and it and it works because uh, I think it's not about the sky beams or the suit really. Yes, the suit is awesome and wouldn't have worked in the nineties. It's because the characters and the performances are really good. Well, that's exactly it. And I think it's also because they hired somebody like John Favreau. And of course, Kevin Feige was also working on this from the get-go. He'd already been a producer in more of a minor role on a number of like Fox X-Men properties mm -hmm. and a bunch of other stuff. So he'd learnt a lot of lessons from seeing what you should or shouldn't do with the characters. He'd soaked up a bunch of superhero movie magic into his baseball cap. Yep. And then he slapped it on one more time. <laughs> and he's like, here we go. Here we go. But I think John Favreau, and the idea that he had to come into this and make it a bit loosey-goosey. There's the famous Jeff Bridges quote, which is... There was no... Oh, wait. We had no script, man. Yeah, so they had, like, this rough outline, but they'd kind of improv the scenes beforehand to kind of get a feel for them and then kind of roll with it in the moment. The dialogue feels very natural, and I think... Hey, take one slice of pizza. You have two slices of pizza. Exactly. Magic like that. Magic like that, but I think... Now that's a formula that they may have locked into too much right. to be like, like I think they've managed to bottle it since mm -hmm. in a number of films and scenarios. And formalise it and lock it down. Yeah, that's what I mean. I think it's this formula that they kind of not accidentally stumbled upon, but kind of crafted and went, this is it. We're just doing, everyone has a quip and a joke and they'll light up your smoke. You know what I mean? That's right. They're still in the Navy, <laughs> except for Terrence Howard. He got fired. <laughs> uh, it's interesting because in the 1960s, Marvel were famous for writing their comics with the Marvel method, yeah. which is where the writer would have some sort of loose outline of the plot and then the artist was just allowed to, to sort of run rampant and draw whatever they want. Mm. And it's kind of similar to how this movie I was... Put together, agree. they're like, okay, he's got to start here and end here, but in the meantime, say whatever you want, baby. <laughs> yeah, that's it. What, what? Tony Stark can have as many slices of pizza he wants. Two. Yes, two, yeah. Now that's locked into the Marvel formula. Everybody's going to take two <laughs> slices of pizza. So there's one moment, uh, I watched a bunch of behind the scenes stuff, but where John Favreau, it confirms to me that he was the right choice for, for this movie because I think he's a great director and they're doing the sound design for the film and it's the scene when he first lands in the war-torn country whatever it is i can't remember i guess i haven't seen it that many times That's correct and the first time he's it's cool mirror thank it's you in afghanistan uh and it, the first time his repulses kind of crank up yeah there's a thunder crack noise that john favreau says that they should put underneath it that then is not utilized later in the movie when he uses it so it's kind of like the first time he he fires it up it's like holy shit mm -hmm. and then the impact is literally lessened every time since then. So that's for the audience. So continuity-wise, it doesn't make any sense that they're louder then than later. Mm -hmm. But that scene just always blew me away. The, the superhero landing for one. And then he kills all those men. <laughs> he kills all those men, yeah. Like a superhero would. Well, that's what he's like, isn't he? But I remember even the trailer when I first saw this and the moment where it really was solidified for me that like I'm definitely seeing this as soon as I can is where he sonic booms past the camera at the very end. It, the suit hits the speed of sound and we yeah. get the sonic boom. And I'm like, that's attention to detail. Exactly. And I think also there's so many little things in this movie that make a huge difference. They focused a lot on getting the flying right. And uh -huh. a lot of it is practical. But they wanted to make it kind of like Spider-Man's web swinging where when he's learning to fly, but he ain't got wings. Correct. To quote another famous Billy Joel song. <laughs> 
it's Tom Petty. Just, <laughs> I, I will not let that one stand. No, I know that, but I just, it, I was making a joke. But no, then... you weren't. You were serious, and you didn't know. <laughs> so, but a lot of this movie is dedicated to him learning to fly because he ain't got wings. I like the Billy Joel song. <laughs> the Billy Joel song, but it's interesting, you yeah, know. Mm-hmm. Because you see in a lot of superhero movies, that's like, oh, look, Mr. Fantastic is learning to stretch. Who cares? He ain't got wings. He ain't got wings. It's true. I mean, there are a few, there are a few moments that upon a, you know, multiple rewatches, you do start to ask some questions. For example, when he flings himself directly into the wall of his garage, why doesn't his face cave in? Remember that? Speaking of caves, remember the bit where they're uh, here in the incentive building the, the suit? Yeah. They're supposed to be building a missile, but then it cuts to like, surveillance footage of them and they're clearly just building a leg yeah. just building a leg like what what excuse were they going to give if the terrorist busted in they'd be like uh you know you know the expression kick butt <laughs> well that's what this missile does goes down and kicks butt that's what this is uh we're building a wee fit uh please don't kill us <laughs> i want to talk about the suit though this is actually stan winston's last film but as he talks about in the behind the scenes he's like i don't make anything anymore i just come in and go pretty good Great, and yeah. then I go home, but you know he doesn't need to at that point. No, he's that's he's true, a legend. Yeah. He's hiring the best. Yeah, but what's interesting about this Iron Man suit? All variations on it is you can technically fit a person inside all of it. Less so with later movies. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So they make multiple versions for this. Uh, the stunt man or one of the stunt men, Mike Justice. Nice. Like the Billy Joel song. <laughs> uh, the big suit that he's in with all the flamethrowers. The that's, Mark One, yeah. Yeah, the Mark One. That's all practical. And when he initially put it on, he could only do like an hour or so in it because it's just this this bag of metal that you're, yeah. that you're sewn into. And then by the end, he got so fit that he could do it for like 12 hours. But there's things like that which I think make a huge difference where on set they had the actual set of armour, suits of armour, all of them, and then often they'd replace them with CGI, but they still look great because they had that frame of reference there to get the reflections and the the detail. I knew one of the reasons they knew they could make this movie was off the back of Transformers because metal is something in CGI which you can do very realistically, like more so than human skin. I see, right, right. Uh, Also, interestingly enough, at the very end of the movie... Robert Downey Jr. is not wearing the suit anymore when he's battling Obadiah Stane. Yep. Where he's just like, I, I just want to eat pasta. I don't care if I'm bloated. I don't want to wear this fucking suit. <laughs> and I think that then carried over into the rest of the movies where he doesn't really... He might maybe wear the chest piece. Yeah, right. Because uh-huh. at the start you see him, he's like, oh my God, I love this suit. How cool is this to be Iron Man or whatever? And then by the end, he's just like, I hate this so much and I'm never doing it again. Yeah. Also, I only got paid half a million dollars and that will not stand sure. <laughs> from here on out. From this point forward, I want everything from the box office all the money yeah here's a question for you though go on what are some things that you think stayed from this movie some things that were locked into the formula oh okay we talked about like the tone you know what I mean quips and quips quips and quips quips and quips and quips quips. (laughs) that's right the post credits obviously yeah Yeah. Uh, what else Um, sequel bait or do you think a lot of that was throwing stuff against the wall like having Coulson, which whose part, by the way, was expanded because they're like, he's got pretty good chemistry. Let's put more of him in it. I think his bloody suit was expanded as well. You see how big that suit is on it? <laughs> <laughs> Looks way better in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. They're like, yeah, he's right. a recurring character now. We'll give him some suits that fit. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. What do you reckon, though? Uh, I mean, you know, the, I think the, the number one thing, in, and, you know, Quips is a very kind of uh, uh, diminutive way to put it, but I yeah. think it's the idea of we're not taking this all that seriously. Mm. Like the world, maybe the world's going to end, but we are having a little bit of, bit of fun. Yeah, I can fly. And it's kind of like that nod and the wink at the audience as if like, because again, this like prior to this, who saw superhero movies? Nerds. <laughs> but I mean, after, Us. After, who's, who's, seen, who's seen these movies now? Billions of dollars yeah. of tickets worth. And it's because somebody might, you know, go into the, one of these movies and look at a character and go, that character's costume looks really dumb. And then a character on screen will go, hey, your costume looks really dumb. Green Lantern. Yeah, and they'll go, huh, well, I guess uh, I guess we're all on the same page. I guess I will watch this movie. It's just yeah. a, and, and it's good for dismantling criticism as well. Mm. Oh, how did he go from there to Gold Mirror in the span of... It doesn't matter. We're yeah. just being, it's being silly. It's just, it, it it's just, being a bit silly. He was just being silly. We're all just being a bit silly, all right? Yeah. Here's some things, though, that I think might be might be lost along the way. These used to be... Terrence just, Howard. Terrence Howard, yes. Mm-hmm. R.I.P. Um, metaphorically. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So these were originally uh, shot on film. They were all shot on That's film. That's true. The first three are shot on film, yeah. I think. The first mm-hmm. three Marvel movies, rather. 
I think a lot of the practical stuff has has gone out the window also. Definitely, yeah. But I think also a lot of the green screen and CGI is so good now that it, it doesn't matter as much now as it... I think it still matters, but it, it mattered more yeah. then than it does now. I know? think if the budgets hadn't kept up with the uh, the popularity of these films, if, if they were still making, you know, $80 million movies, doing it on digital and all CGI maybe would not look as good, but, you know, yeah. they're, they're putting $200 million plus into these movies. So. Exactly, yeah. There's even moments where they're in the desert and those helicopters fly in to rescue Tony Stark. That's real. And it, there was also, like, a real sandstorm when, you know, they recover his armour and mm -hmm. they're going to recreate it. And they were just like, there's a sandstorm and we're just going to shoot this anyway. Sure, right. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Which, which I quite like. But even the flamethrowers, they're real for yeah. the most part. I know there's one moment, you told me this, where... The Mark I suit goes down on his knees and then stands up. That's not real, is that right? Because the suit can't... Oh, it can't like bend that? at the knee, Pap. Maybe so. I think you told me that. I, I said a lot of things in my youth that were <laughs> lies. <laughs> yeah, sure. But maybe, sure. Yeah. But um, the character of Iron Man himself, this is something I only kind of realise now going back to it. It's like he considers himself already dead. Like for a lot of these movies, and I think mm. even up to Endgame in a lot of ways... He knows he's on borrowed time. Sure, yeah, like yeah. Like he's poisoned in one of the movies, you know what I mean? Mm, he's got yeah. massive PTSD. I think only when he starts a family and he wants to build something, he's like, this is now something I want to hold on to. But I think he knows that he was never supposed to get this far. Oh, yeah. do you think perhaps it was all a dream in the mind of a man who got blown up in, in Afghanistan? Perhaps it was. I think it was. I'm I, sure that's a I theory. I think it's safer to assume that. Yeah. <laughs> and and we should ask that of Kevin Feige every time we see it. <laughs> it's true, yeah. <laughs> so was this all a dream, Kevin? <laughs> Kevin, answer my letters, Kevin. Anyways, my point is he was supposed to die because he sucks, like as mm. a man. <laughs> He's yes. not a good person. <laughs> yeah, that's true, yeah. Here's something, uh, I was going to call it trivia, but I'm going to call it little things. Little oh, things I've got a couple of little things. Let's do some little things. I've written here, a lot of Obadiah Stane's menace evaporates when you remember the bit where he rides a Segway. <laughs> sure. Yeah. That was so 2000 and late, wasn't it? The little 2000 and late. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what do you got? What's a little bit you've got there? Uh, the Mandarin was supposed to wear the suit originally of the Iron Monger or something in that style. Uh -huh. And he was going to be, in an early draft, an Indonesian terrorist. Uh -huh. But John Favreau was worried about how you would handle a character like the Mandarin. The Iron Monger was then supposed to become the villain in the second movie. Uh -huh. But then they were like, the Mandarin's a, a weird character to balance. From a white guy like me. Which I guess is why they haven't <laughs> touched it in over a decade yeah, properly. Sure. I mean, they did like the Guy Pierce thing, which we'll get yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, they're like, we are really going to roll this guy with a Fu Manchu mustache. And, and, he, and he's got alien dragon rings <laughs> that yeah. are magic, but also technology or something. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Uh, what about this? An early draft of the script revealed Tony Stark to be the creator of Dr. Otto Octavius's tentacles from Spider-Man. Avi Arad, yes. famous Spider-Man ruiner and producer, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. was a producer on this. Ah, he yes. was quickly kind of shuffled, shuffled aside. Away, okay. But Iron Man just creating villains all day, you know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Uh, Iron Man <laughs> Even in universes he doesn't exist in, he's creating <laughs> that's right, villains. That's right. Iron Man also the creator of, and here's something that I... This, this movie's been out since 2008. Yep. I've never been able to figure it out. At one point... Stark does say that uh, Stark Industries is responsible for the life-saving technology of Intellicromps. <laughs> what? Intellicromps. Has it got an MCU wiki? He's having. It's not. I couldn't find it. <laughs> he's having that interview with the with the reporter, and he's like, "We save lives with our Intellicromps." <laughs> um, <laughs> Sounds like he misspoke. I, maybe it does, and I mean, maybe he just maybe he just threw it out there, expecting the reporter to not have an answer or to not look it up. Yeah, yeah. But I'm based on the name. <laughs> My assumption is it's some sort of Wi-Fi enabled crumpet. Because, <laughs> you know, sometimes you put a crumpet in a toaster, yeah. you put it down, it comes up, it hasn't been done enough. You put it back in, comes up, it's burnt. Yeah, oh, yeah. But you're connected to Wi-Fi. Yeah. Always perfect. Peace in the Middle East. That's all I'm saying. I think it might be a specifically British invention, but yeah, then it all went under because of Brexit or whatever. Yeah, probably you know what that. Mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. They yeah. couldn't get the parts. That's the whole right. company folded. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Thanks, Boris. Uh, the likes of Mark Millar, Joe Casada, Brian Michael Bendis, they were commissioned and you see them in the behind the scenes thing at a round table being like, Iron Man is this and whatever. So a lot of famous comic book artists. That's not specific enough if you ask me. <laughs> just no, come why do they didn't get the Come in the check. Yeah. I just think that's really, like that's something they 
they don't often do. Get That's actual true. comic book creators. Yeah. Uh, Paul Bettany, who now famously plays The Vision, recalled all of his lines as Jarvis in two hours. He said it was like performing a robbery. So Terrific. in a way it is. Yeah. Uh, Joke's on you now, Bettany. <laughs> <laughs> Eight hours of makeup a day. Well, now it's just like they paint his face like one colour, isn't it? Then CGI the rest. Well, that's even more embarrassing. I agree. Uh, Peter Billingsley. Ah, oh, Ralphie from A Christmas Story. Yes. He's uh, one of the scientists uh, that um, Obadiah Stane yells at. Tony Stark was able to build this in a cave. With a box of scraps! Because mm. he can't build a tiny little arc reactor. And then he comes back in. Spider-Man Far From Home. That's right, That's exactly. Right. Uh, here's something which is fascinating. If this film didn't succeed, Marvel would have lost the intellectual property rights to their library. I actually made a video on this. It's called something like Marvel's Biggest Gamble, where they just went, we're just going to go all in. Yeah, I mean, but in, in a lot of ways, it is kind of a sweetheart deal. Mm. Because if you made a huge budget Iron Man movie and it sucked really bad... I would never. I'd make a good one. Who is going to take another gamble on it? You know what I mean? I mean, you get everything else, though. Yeah. You get the company. Mm. They probably make silk boxer shorts. <laughs> sure. That's my favourite hero. My favorite, <laughs> That was my favourite Marvel hero from as a kid. <laughs> silk boxer shorts. <laughs> okay, I just have one more thing. Uh, this is from the start of the movie okay. before we cut to the flashback uh, I've written here. I would also get my phone out in the middle of a firefight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tweet about it or whatever, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, tweet about it or whatever. Yeah, get, a, get an Instagram live. Can you believe this, I'd say? Might might get you in on the call. I you would... could be like, I can't believe this. <laughs> Just watch you get shot there. head. <laughs> yep. <laughs> So many hug reacts. <laughs> yeah. So uh, one thing I do want to talk about for this, which I think is fascinating, is the box office performance. Please. Because this was the eighth highest grossing movie of 2008. These are the movies that came before it. The Dark Knight at number one, Indiana Jones, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, Kung Fu Panda, Hancock, Mamma Mia, Madagascar, Escape to Africa, Quantum of Solace. And I think what people forget from this is that if you're trying to build a cinematic universe, your first one isn't necessarily going to be a Pirates of the Caribbean 1, the biggest movie of the year, if that movie even is that. That's right. I think studios now, they're going for a big swing, expecting they're going to make a billion dollars up front. And then it makes $800 million, and they're like, forget it. We're cancelling this, and we're waiting two years, and we're doing it again in the dark universe. <laughs> exactly. But then, like, the first Marvel movie to make a billion, I, I think it was Avengers. Yeah. You know? Which was four years after this. And ultimately, the only people that learned from this and were successful at it well, the MCU, obviously, mm -hmm. and the Mamma Mia franchise. <laughs> yes, that's and here right. we go again. Anyways, all I'm saying is that everybody who worked on this movie in hindsight should get $10 million. Disney should just give them $10 million. And anybody who watched it, $10 <laughs> million. Dollars. Even more so. Per viewing. I watched it twice for this. <laughs> Did you? Yeah. Good stuff. Anyways, we'll be back next week to talk Iron Man 2. Uh, which I think tries to replicate a lot of this and doesn't. Mm, but yep. it's got some, you know, some pretty decent stuff in it, I feel. I agree. Yeah. Mostly the, the suit and the briefcase. It's the suit and the briefcase, yeah, so, absolutely. And Sam Rockwell. Oh, yeah, good the point. The suit and a briefcase of actors. <laughs> yeah, just a real charm. Just a real just a real surprise out of the box, you know? Love, <laughs> love his work. <laughs> Me too. But you might be like, man, I wish I could see these early. And guess what you can if you go to oh. bigsandwich.co, where not only does the extended audio edition go up early, as does the actual video, which Ben puts together with Lawrence. Whoa. That's right. There's a bunch of other stuff there also, including our podcast, The Weekly Planet, goes up there a week early, doesn't it, Mason? That's right. No, a not week a week early. early. A, a day, day early. early. Thank Jinx. you. Jinx. Have to buy me a Coke. He doesn't drink Coke. He'll give it right back. I'll do a Coke, no sugar, Mason. <sighs> it's not the rule. It's not how it works. <laughs> That's a good point. We've actually done commentaries up there for a bunch of Marvel movies, including Iron Man, actually. That's right. If you do, if you do want to check it out. Oh, but yeah, like I said, it's like it's like a Patreon tier, isn't it, Mason? It's nine bucks a month if you do want That's it. But you right. don't have to. If you've got suggestions of Caravan of Garbage, let, let us know. I mean, we're booked for the next couple of weeks, but after that. Should we do Iron Man 2? Let us know. Yeah. Should we do Iron Man 3? Let us know. Let us know whether you want that. Yeah. Anyways, I'm at Mr. Sunday Movies Should on Should we Twitter. do Iron Man oh. 4? Yes. I mean, we will. Eventually. If, I mean, if they make yeah. If they make it, we if will. If you petition Kevin Feige in the street. <laughs> like, yeah, Kevin. Kevin. I'm at four. Yeah. Is it a dream? Do you his hat's running out of that juice? No. He's got no, it all. It's, a, it's the juiciest hat in the land. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm at Mr. Sunday Movies on Twitter. I'm at Wikipedia Brown on Twitter. See you next week. Grab that gem, you guys. We'll see you next week. Jinx Goodbye. again. Jinx oh, again. You, you jinxed me. Buy me a Coke, though. Hey, I'll buy you a Coke.